Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. Dear Family will explore many angles of mental illness, including isolation, drug addiction, and even suicide. Sounds like fun, huh? Well, you'd be surprised, actually. Because once we get so invested with Rachel's guests, we can actually relate to many of the issues that naturally arise during her conversations. And what often follows is a knowing laughter. So yes, expect tears of heartfelt empathy, but don't be surprised if you chuckle now and then. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Andy Berman is a larger than life personality a nonfiction writer and a national speaker. Andy was the subject of a New York media scandal for counterfeiting the modern art of Mark Katsabi, the same art he once sold, putting him in federal prison for five months. Andy spent numerous sleepless nights fueled by drugs, had anonymous sex, traveled aimlessly, went on midnight binges, and was even a male hustler. But before all of that, Andy had a happy childhood, growing up in New Jersey, a golden boy who went on to graduate from Wesleyan University. But because he was never comfortable in his own skin, he sought a high wherever he could find one, and he went on to change jobs the way some people change outfits. He became a filmmaker, a PR agent, a stripper, or whatever made him feel invincible and bright. For years, he was misdiagnosed by psychiatrists and psychotherapists, which only fueled his out-of-control euphoric highs and tornado-like rages of depression putting his life in jeopardy. At his most psychotic, Andy imagined himself chewing on sidewalks and swallowing sunlight. He was finally diagnosed with bipolar when he was 29 years old. After trying over 45 different medications, he decided to try electroconvulsive therapy, formerly known as electric shock treatment. After all, Ernest Hemingway did ECT and Andy thought it was glamorous. 19 treatments later, Andy wrote Electro Boy, a memoir of mania. At one time, Andy became a spokesman for Bristol Myers Squibb, later publicly criticizing them for their marketing techniques. He made a YouTube video that has over a million views and it's titled Abilify Kills. It gained him a large and dedicated Twitter following over the years. Andy lives in Los Angeles with his two beautiful teenage daughters. He doesn't believe in true recovery for bipolar, but rather he feels lucky to manage his disorder by taking it one day at a time. One thing is for sure, Andy is outspoken, lively, and controversial. I'm so pleased to welcome Andy Berman. All right. Hi, Andy. Hi. We first met when you came into my creative nonfiction class at UCLA Extension, taught by Allison Singhi. Hi, Allison. And you spoke about your memoir, Electro Boy, which I absolutely loved and immediately gave to my mom. So in person and on the page, I was just riveted by your story and your high energy about how your undiagnosed bipolar, which back then you called manic depression, pushed you into art forgery, among other things. When I met you, it was around the same time that my mom got her bipolar diagnosis. And of course, when I look back, it's so obvious that she had bipolar most of her life, which likely was what you dealt with. But I was beginning to research bipolar and understand it. And I could so clearly see my mom's story and your story, which is, I think, why your book hit such a nerve with so many people. I also really appreciated the fine line and the connection between brilliance and creativity and mania. And as a spectator, bipolar energy is alluring to watch, but it's also confusing to witness. But now that I understand the causes and the symptoms of bipolar and mood disorders, I'm able to see it better through clinical lenses. And I have so much more patience and understanding and, of course, compassion because I understand how difficult it is. And I also know that there's a lot of hope out there, that it doesn't have to be a death sentence. There is hope and there is... Well, there's a lot more hope than there was 20 years ago. Right, 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 right. And so anyways, I want to have you tell us in your own words, how are you feeling today? And also, I'm curious, because I have a family history of mental illness, is there a family history 
of mental illness in your family. Sure. I want to go back to what you said sure. about bipolar disorder being a, quote, death sentence. I mean, in throes of my really being ill around the time of my diagnosis, maybe a couple years later when no medications were working for me, my parents went to see a psychiatrist on their own to talk to her about my treatment, about my treatment alternatives. And when this psychiatrist listened to everything that they had to say, she said to them, let me just tell it to you this way. 50% of all people with bipolar disorder will take their lives. My father stormed out, my mother screamed, and they never saw that doctor again. And did they tell you that? No, they right. never told they me never that. They never told you that, right. They never That's told why me that. They? Yeah. Because they thought that their kid was special. Right. And in the end, I don't know if their kid, meaning me, was special, but I was tough as hell and I was really going to fight this. I even tell people who come to me who have bipolar disorder or, you know, any other mental illness today, you know, you can see mental health care professionals, you can see every psychologist, every psychiatrist you want, but you really have to want to get well. You have to want to say, I can't live this miserable life any longer. And I think that's when getting well really starts. Being sick for me for, you know, almost 15 years was exhausting. Every single day was exhausting. And I was done with it. I wanted to see what else was out there. And so how are you feeling today? Right, I was going to say. And so <laughs> I successfully did not answer your question. How am I feeling today? Well, today is, it's not today. It's how am I feeling when I realized I was done with ECT, when I found a medication regimen that worked, when I was seeing a psychiatrist regularly, a therapist regularly, was in group regularly. I was all of a sudden extremely hopeful, but then I was also sitting with the problem of, okay, so I feel pretty good right now, but I've destroyed my life. You know, I've ended up in prison. I've been through every single form of addiction, alcohol, cocaine, sex. I've spent every penny I've earned. So I've got to start over again. And how am I going to start over again? I can't go back to being an art dealer after I've, you know, publicly been in the limelight for being an art counterfeiter. Yeah, I used to be a public relations guy. Can I do that? What am I going to do? And what's going to make me feel good? And I said, you know, I think I'll start out, and I was on disability at this time, I think I'll start out by writing and by telling my story. Because quite honestly, I've never read a book besides Kay Redfield Jamison's book. Which is the best. It's the Bible, yeah. It's the best. It's the Bible. But if you're a young guy, True. you have no idea what yeah. the hell she's talking about. Right. I yeah. mean, her form of bipolar disorder was not my form. Right. And she's also a doctor. She's right. not a patient. So I was like, oh my God, there's no male patient out there who's ever shared his account with battling mental illness. I mean, this is 1998. I couldn't find anything. The first piece of writing that I read was Prozac Nation by Elizabeth Wurzel. And I was like, mm, I'm kind of inspired. And then I went to hear Kay Redfield Jamison speak, and I thought, I get what she's saying, but she's still not telling my story. And first of all, I can't even find a friend or a family member who knows what bipolar disorder or manic depression is. So I've got to do something. And I said, the most important thing for me to do is to tell the most honest story. And the most honest story that I'm going to tell is going to be extremely embarrassing. Hey, the more honest and embarrassing, the better in my view. Yeah. I mean, well, it, and I, and I it wasn't. I told my parents that I was going to take a little bit of time to write a book about bipolar disorder. I didn't tell them that it was going to be a memoir. I figured it would give me two years of safety so that they weren't going to question me about what I was doing. 
I was on disability. They were helping to support me. So I figured, you know, let them have it easy now because eventually they're going to read this. Yeah, so that, that is one of my questions. Memoir. How did they take your memoir? Oh, they did not take it well. Oh, no, they did not. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I went out to dinner with them. The book was about to be published in four weeks. I gave it to them at dinner at two in the morning. I guess my mom's a quick reader. She called and said, what is this disgusting uh -oh. piece of trash? This is pornography. This is not true. I don't know whose story this is. We want to see your therapist right away with you. I said, fine, come see my therapist. So we went to see my therapist and my therapist said to my parents, why don't you tell me what did you think of the book? And my father said, I was shocked, but I appreciated Andy's candor and honesty. Then the therapist asked my mother the same question and she said, I hated every single part oh, God. of Electro Boy. <sighs> and she said, I just couldn't bear reading about my son stripping in seedy sex clubs in Times Square. And the doctor said, well, what was so shocking about that? She said, I couldn't even get him to dance at bar mitzvahs. Oh, my God. That's, that's perfect. That, that's comedy. No, but it's, it's perfect. It's, yeah, I mean, and what mother would be comfortable with learning that about their child? Of course, that's going to be hard. But I have found writing is one of the best forms of therapy and just getting it out on paper, right? And, right. and the fact that you were so honest. And a male perspective, you probably really opened up a lot of people. Well, eyes. men are not supposed to share information about illness because it makes them very vulnerable and they need to be quiet about illness, any kind of illness. Right, right. You're not supposed to talk about how illness makes you feel. Right. Or that I woke up one morning and I was so miserable. You know, I wanted to die. Right. You're supposed to just bite the bullet and be strong and well, put I mean, on I, this I, I armor. Taken, I should, exactly. I should have yeah. taken, you know, my dad's advice, which is, you know, I really think you should be exercising more. You should be running more. You should, I mean, it was like, ugh, okay, that's how I grew up. Right. It didn't help. It didn't push the illness away then. It's not going to make me feel better right. now. Well, and Andy, I mean, I have to say that is a big reason why I'm doing this podcast is because when I finally understood that my mom's mental illness was real, then I realized that all those times I thought, come on, pull yourself up, like figure it out. Stop acting that way. I realized it wasn't her fault. Well, I got the it, same. I mean, my father used to say, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You're a strong, tough guy. You can do it you know, let's get you back to where you were. I'm like, well, you don't understand. I'm not well. Right. I mean, you know, I'm psychotic. I'm taking antipsychotics. Right. I'm walking down Madison Avenue and seeing like a button from my shirt becoming an oversized button, you know, chasing me down the street. It's a very hard way to live. I know. I mean, I can't imagine. And I know, thankfully, you consider yourself stable now, but you have admitted that you had the desire to take your life lurks around the corner. And I know that you've had like psychotic suicidal attempts. Is that correct? Not psychotic suicidal attempts, but in Electro Boy, I outlined probably maybe two or three suicidal attempts, and none of them are real. Oh, you're right. None of them are real. Wow, you read very closely. I called my doctor once and I said, I'm in the middle of a suicide attempt. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm drowning myself in the bathtub. I said, but there's no water in the bathtub. Hmm. So I was just imagining that I was drowning. Right. I mean, when you get to that point, you realize that you're, you're really in trouble. Right. But how amazing that you kind of had this wherewithal to reach out to your psychiatrist and I had a great psychiatrist yeah people are really lucky if they do have a good psychiatrist people are lucky if they have good doctors good psychiatrists good doctors good therapists or you know in my history you know one in 20. Speaking of good psychiatry you had never heard of bipolar and you were misdiagnosed as depressed 
Eight times. Eight times. And I now understand this because this happened to my mom too. She was given depression medicine, which Fueled. if you're bipolar, fuels your mania. And if it's prolonged mania, it can push into psychosis. So what happened when you finally got that proper diagnosis? Well, yeah, I mean, the problem was what person with bipolar disorder who's manic and who's on a high and who's traveling around the world, and in my case, you know, making millions of dollars and, you know, really enjoying life in their late 20s, early 30s, is going to go to their psychiatrist and present themselves as anything else but depressed. I mean, I would never go if I was feeling manic or great. But when I was slipping, which was, you know, one to two percent of the time, I'd show up and say, I feel miserable. So that's the first doctor who said, you're definitely suffering with depression. I have a new drug that's going to be available to you in about a month or two. It's called Prozac. <laughs> so, of course, when he gave me 20 milligrams of Prozac, I lied to him and told him I didn't feel any different. But I was just getting higher and mm -hmm. higher and higher. He finally put me up to 40 milligrams, and then I was able to buy it on the street, and I took 80 milligrams. And I know that you admit one of the secrets of manic depression or bipolar is the pleasure that the mania can bring, and I'm going to quote you. You said, it's an emotional state similar to Oz, full of excitement, color, noise, and speed, an overload of sensory stimulation, whereas the sane state of Kansas is plain and simple, black and white, boring and flat. You know, I can also relate to this because my mom told me that she really misses her mania. She misses the highs. And that was part of the reason she stopped taking some of her medication. Do you miss the highs or are you at a stage in your life where you prefer to be even? I miss the highs. Yeah. I mean, I love the evenness, but I certainly go back and, you know, I read a book like this, and I should add, I don't really identify with this character in the book who happens to be me. I'm thinking, oh my God, this poor pathetic guy is on this course of destruction, but he's having a great time. I look back at the character in Electro Boy and I have to remind myself, oh my God, that's me. And the story of a guy who's battling bipolar disorder, but at the same time, He's experiencing these wild ups and downs. He's kind of walking this tightrope, knowing that there's no net underneath. If he falls, he's really in trouble. I mean, I was the kind of guy who would stand on the subway platform in New York thinking, what would it look like if I jumped in front of the subway? Or do I have tremendous superpowers? Would the train just go right over me and miss me? And that was the scary part about mm -hmm. this illness, because so many times I thought this illness and its potential to kill me wouldn't. And I have to tell you, do we curse on this show? Yes, no. totally. I'm so fucking lucky I never died. Thank God. Thank God for my parents. Yes. Because my parents suffered, because this illness doesn't just affect it affects families. It affects loved well, ones. It destroys families. Yeah. It destroyed yeah. my family. It destroyed my relationships with friends. And all the families I speak to now say, I can't tell you what this illness is doing to this family. Yeah. Not just to our son. Yeah. I mean, I can still relate because I was so ready to kick my mom out of my life. And she also had pressured speech. Did you have that? Did you get pressured speech where you just talked nonstop and rambled? Or do you even remember? Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I, I, that was like, it was so hard to listen to. I just would have to cut, you know, I just would look for an excuse to hang up. And I mean, now when you say so, pressured speech, I mean, it's not a term I've ever heard oh, of. Oh, yeah, it's but a I, term. I have to tell you, it was a pressured life. It was right. like, I was a nonstop pain in the ass yeah. it was always something a letter was always coming about a problem that i had caused somebody was always showing up saying okay andy's in trouble again i was in court i feel like i've avoided one of your questions let's go back to it okay. which was how do you feel today okay i'd love to tell you that i'm recovered and i feel incredible and i feel wonderful every single day 
is a new day, but I am so careful because I know that trouble lurks around the corner every single day too. But it's trouble that I can manage. Right. I didn't have the skills to manage before. Absolutely. I would just go with the temptation. You are battling every day, but you're honest with yourself and you're talking about a safety net. Just by speaking to me, I can turn and become a safety net for you just by reaching out to a friend or, you know, there are advocates that can help you. And I think that that takes a lot of bravery. And I really appreciate your honesty. You talked about this pressure that you felt and, you know, you were incarcerated for art fraud. And you recently told me that you had to spend nine hours at Goodwill to work off parking tickets. And you had to do 80 hours of hard work at Caltrans for moving violations because you didn't show up at the court. Is that have to do with still that kind of pressure you're under and bipolar no, or, kind or of, do you think that that's I not related? I kind of feel like it's the residual it's part the of residual. the illness. It's like the part of me that says, you know, fuck it. These rules don't apply to me. I'm, you know, Superman. There's no one watching. I mean, I'm just going to roll through this stop sign. It doesn't really matter because no one's looking. But, you know, in my life, even though I drive in my horse with a, in my car, in my horse, I drive in my car <laughs> with a horseshoe for good luck, I'm always pulled over. And I'm just thinking, oh, God, it's again. Okay, okay. Me. So then. Yeah. But here's the good part. Yeah, is, let's so, yeah. Part. so I do my like 13 hours of community service at Goodwill. And you're so lucky if you get the bipolar guy to come work for you at Goodwill. Because <laughs> he's, you... he's insane. You make him like the head of like ladies' shoes. <laughs> And like, I take like 600 pair of shoes that aren't pairs yet. And I connect them. I put them together and I divide them up into brands and sizes. And I leave after my like eight hour shift. And, you know, the manager says to me, wow. <laughs> like, wow. Can you come back? Never had a volunteer like you. How many hours do you have left? Awesome. I'm like, five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Five. Well, I mean, that's, but, but but that's yeah. the really weird thing about us people. Yeah. We really do a great job, and we're really great about detail. And when we set our minds out to you know accomplishing something really major, we do it, and we do it really well. I mean, the other day I was on Twitter, and I was like, oh god, this is a good tweet, but I don't want to put it out there if a hundred people are going to like it. Set a goal, Andy. Set a goal. And it was just about. Trump and it was about his mental illness. And I said, I'm not going to be fearful anymore in saying, you know, it's time to call out this president for really being unfit to lead the country. So I just kept, you know, feeding it to people who I knew would help it explode. And then I was like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. Like, why do I have to prove that I can generate this really, you know, high number on this tweet? But when I woke up, it had hit like 11,000 likes, which wow. is pretty amazing. It's pretty good. Can you tell us what electric shock therapy was like or, yeah, you know, and, I mean, and did it cause memory loss? Yeah, it's funny. The British call it electric shock. Okay. Americans call it electroshock okay. or electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. It was a last resort for me, but quite honestly, I made the choice myself. I told my doctor, okay. So I've been on more than 45 different medications to treat my bipolar disorder. Nothing's really working. So I thought, let's try ECT. And I thought it for two reasons. One was, hey, let's have some fun. Okay. But the second one was a really good reason, a much better reason. One was, I'm tired of family and friends saying, Andy, you're not getting well. So at least I can tell them I have tried what's considered the most barbaric treatment for depression or bipolar disorder. First, I should say, and it's very important to say, that it's not a barbaric treatment at all. I dread going to the dentist much more. Wow, and that's really interesting. Well, you're under a general anesthetic. Right. So my first treatment, I was really scared because I didn't know what to expect. And you're it, under a general anesthetic when you get ECT? Absolutely, okay. the whole time. So I remember laying on a gurney and being pulled into the OR and my doctor was in there, and I recognized him, and the anesthesiologist was in there, a couple doctors, and then there was a group of residents who had never seen an ECT treatment done before, and I was 
everything. I was strapped down. I was wired. I was monitored. I had something called salicylic acid going through my system, which was keeping me hydrated. And then the anesthesiologist was ready to put me under with Brevitol. My doctor told me to count backwards. So I went from 10, 9, 8, and I was out. I had electrodes on my head, but they weren't really giving me more than 180 volts of electricity, which is not too much. It's enough to light a light bulb. Waking up in recovery with, you know, probably like 20 other people. And I remember hearing like lots of moaning. And I kept thinking, God, this seems like some battlefield from a film. Like everybody's like just moaning and like whining and like, oh. I said, but I don't feel so terrible. And a nurse came over to me. I said, where am I? Where am I? I just had totally forgotten where I was. And she said, you're at Gracie Square Hospital in New York. You've just had your first round of ECT. And I was like, wow, I feel pretty good. I feel better than when I started. She said, do you feel like you can get off the gurney? I said, yes. And she said, come with me, Electro Boy. Wow. So that was the title. And you, got of the up, book. you were able to get up? And <laughs> yeah, I got up. And how did you feel after? I felt pretty good. I was brought to my room. My parents were waiting for me there. I was walking. I said hi to them. The nurse put me into bed. And I said, I don't want to be in bed. I feel really good. And I started doing jumping jacks. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is great. I feel like I'm five years old again. Like, do people really feel this good every single day? I said, I can't believe that people feel this good. I mean, I haven't felt this good since I was five years old. I feel like the concrete in my brain has been liquefied. You know, I kind of feel like, you know, Drano has been pushed through my whole system. You know, and when I asked my doctor, I said, you know, what did you really do in there? He said, well, just imagine a bingo tumbler and us just turning it like in a circle, you know, and us just kind of mixing up the neurons. And I was like, whatever you did, it feels really good. And then you had 18 more treatments. Well, I had four in the first 10 days that I was hospitalized. Wow. The problem... Do they increase the voltage every time? I don't, or I don't right? think so, okay. no. I had four in that first 10 days. But I do have to tell you that my memory loss was immediate. Yeah. I had asked my doctor, will I experience memory loss? And he said to me, not necessarily. But when a nurse walked into the room to check on how I was doing, my parents were there. I said, can you please leave the room? And my parents said, that's your sister. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean... My and I also thought I was in Connecticut. I had no idea where I was. It's so interesting, yeah. I and mean, my mom remembers her mom not recognizing her as a little girl, which obviously... Yeah, the memory loss really... was really bad. And then when I yeah. finally got out of the hospital, I went back to my apartment on the Upper West Side, and I kept thinking, my dad brought me in. And I thought, God... Whoever lives here has a really nice apartment. <laughs> and things smelled similar to my apartment. And he said, well, this is your apartment. Wow. And that must I, have been scary for your parents. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, this is just an aside, but it's yeah. an interesting aside. When I had my first electroshock treatment, I had served five months in prison, but I was still under house arrest for my counterfeiting crime. So I was wearing an electronic monitor on my ankle. So even in my mind, there was a lot of confusion. I'm like, wait, I'm wearing an electronic monitor. I'm having ECT. There's a lot going on here. Wow. And I was also thinking at the same time, this is a fucking disaster. This is not the way it was supposed to end up. Like, I was the golden child. You know, I was the high school yearbook editor, class president, student government president. Why am I ending up? in this hospital? Why am I ending up so sick? How did I get so sick? And there was that part of me that wonders why I was chosen to get sick. Part of me is very angry still about why we're chosen to get sick, whether it's a physical illness. And I pray, the one thing I pray every day is that I don't ever get a physical illness because I know I know how to combat a psychiatric illness. But I feel like a physical illness ever struck me, I wouldn't be able to pull it off. But maybe I would. I don't know. I mean, this experience has given me so much more strength. It's given me too much strength. 
to the point where I overcompensate for the smallest thing, meaning I'm a tremendous fighter, but it causes me to fight over really small things, like garbage cans not being in the right place, like, you know. So that's a little bit of OCD, maybe. Well, that was the problem in the beginning. Right. But... uh, The control. You needed that control. No, I just... I mean, I was always a fighter. And hey, maybe that's one of the reasons that I made it through this anyhow. But it's interesting, Andy, that you say about a physical illness as opposed to a mental illness. I actually think you fighting a mental illness is in many respects harder because you've had the stigma against you your whole, you know. Yeah, but I don't want to be diagnosed with cancer. Well, I mean, who does, right? Of course no, not. but, but I, there's but, more sympathy. There's more compassion. Well, I always, but I always used to say, I always used to say, you know, could somebody please amputate my leg? Instead, and take away this bipolar disorder. That's the deal I'm willing to make. Right. Take it away. Well, and also you mentioned like in so many words, why me? Why did I get this? Is there any mental illness in your family? Yeah, absolutely. There's addiction. There's obsessive compulsive disorder. There's what I would have to say is bipolar disorder. Right. And if this was grandparents, there was no discussion of that. It was, there was just... There's no discussion of it today. Right. There's no discussion of it today. The only person in the family who has any kind of mental illness and has since 1900 is me, <laughs> which is the <laughs> right. funniest thing in the world because right. I know my grandparents really well. I knew them really well. I know my parents really well. And I know my sibling really well. And there you know, we're not less mental illness. I no know what I know it. what happened, but yeah. no, it's a lot easier for the family to say, "Wow, look what happened since you know your grandfather came from Russia in 1906. Right, you became ill. Right, you know, it's like I'm the one who carried the illness for this family. Right, but well, you know, you're the one that but, came but out. here's the upside, and only I could find the upside because I had no choice but to find the upside, and I'm actually pretty emotional about this is that I'm also the one who got to tell the story. That's a gift to be able to share a story like that with so many and touch so many people. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a gift, but it's a risk. It's a risk. I mean, you have to be willing to accept the fact that people are going to judge you. It's not easy being... Have you felt that judgment? I don't care about it. Yeah, because I would think, you know, it would give you bravery and a sense of... I don't care anymore. I don't need anyone else's... I don't need anyone else's great... Right. God, you're so amazing. I can't believe you pulled through this. Fuck that. Right. You know what? 20 years ago, you weren't listening. 30 years ago, you weren't listening. But now, all of a sudden, guess what? Speaking about mental illness is... You know, oh, it's everyone's yeah. talking about mental There's a whole illness. month dedicated to it. Right. right? Fuck yeah. That. yeah. I mean, like, I don't yeah. care about that. Yeah. Like, oh, how are we going to celebrate, yeah. you know, Mental Health Awareness Month? Yeah. How about Mental Health Awareness Life? Right. For 25 right. years, I've been like this. Right. The good news is, is our teenage daughters who love, for example, Billie Eilish, mm. she's talking about mental illness. I mean, not that it's becoming, you know, something. No, but I love to that Billie Eilish is talking. I love it's... that she's talking about mental illness. I don't mean to criticize people for saying, hey, let's all talk about mental illness. But I keep thinking, I never knew a person with right. a diagnosis of bipolar disorder when I was 27. Right. And I didn't have a computer. Well, I did, but I wasn't, you know, nobody was Googling. Yeah, that was not happening. Nobody was Googling. So I could only find a few books. That's the part where I said, and I was very manic at the time, fuck that. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a memoir. And it's going to be about this thing that I've lived with. I mean, I didn't know that I was writing. The book didn't have the title, A Memoir of Mania. And the book was really about growing up in Manhattan in the 80s. But then when we realized that 90% of it was about my mental illness, then it kind of gained the title of, Electro Boy, A Memoir of Mania. It was really about growing up in Manhattan in the 80s, which was a really weird time. It's like when Madonna was 25. And before Random House published the book, everyone was like, oh, wow, this is the new Brett Easton Ellis. I was like, oh, no. Speaking of being in Manhattan in the 80s, you speak about male hustling and stripping. 
and yet you also married a woman and you have two daughters. That's true. Do you consider yourself bisexual? I think in the book I wrote, I was omnisexual, which was a term that my editor came up with. He thought that was more appropriate. But that means like that, that at omni. that point, being so manic, I would have sex with just about anybody or anybody because it was convenient at the time. And hypersexuality is very well, common with mania. Well, hypersexuality is, right, very common with people with bipolar disorder. And it's a huge problem, a really huge problem. But yeah, in answer to your question, I was, you know, all over the place. I mean, you know, I wasn't thinking about relationships, although after college, I was living with a woman. I lived with her for seven years. We were engaged, never got married. That ended, and that ended because she couldn't live with my illness. There was no way she could live with my illness. It was pretty impossible. And we didn't know that it was my illness that she couldn't live with. It was just me she couldn't live with. Because you were not diagnosed yet. I wasn't diagnosed yet. I was all over the place. I was, you know, out until four in the morning. I was working crazy hours. I was in public relations. I was just a difficult partner to live with. Are you currently taking any medication? Yeah. I mean, I'm not taking 14 medications, but, you know, there are no patients today, 15, 20 years later, who are taking 14 medications. I take two medications. Are they mood stabilizers? One's a mood stabilizer and one's an anti-anxiety medication. Normally, are you getting sleep now? Uh, That makes a big difference, too. Sure, I get sleep, but, you know, I don't get eight hours of sleep. I'm lucky to get five hours of sleep. Okay. But five hours of sleep is enough. I mean, unfortunately, one of the meds that I'm on for anti-anxiety, I probably don't need to be on. I used to be on 16 milligrams a day. Now I'm on three milligrams a day, but the point is I'm addicted to it. I can't get off it. I mean, getting off that med would require my going to rehab for three months. It's not something I'm addressing right now. The drug isn't killing me, but yes, I too am a victim of Big Pharma. They got me addicted and now I can't get off it. There are a lot of negatives. But there are also a lot of positives, right? I mean, I look at my own mom. I can speak for my mom. She's taking three mood stabilizers. And to be perfectly honest, she's never been better. So I'm grateful for whatever cocktail she's taking is working for her. Does that mean you're grateful for Big Pharma? I'm grateful for her medications helping her, right? I'm not grateful for people being addicted to medications if they don't need them. But I've definitely... I'm a proponent if someone needs help with medication. I'm a proponent of meds if people need meds. I'm not a proponent of meds if doctors are just having a lot of fun and are being remunerated for writing prescriptions. Right. There's definitely overprescribing. Every day and almost every doctor I've ever met has been a big prescription writer. I don't think that patients should be able to go into their doctor and say, oh, I saw a commercial on TV and it seemed like a really great drug. Would you let me try that drug? And the doctor says yes or no. But generally that doctor knows exactly what he or she wants to prescribe anyhow because he or she, you know, is being paid to prescribe that drug. He or she has quotas to write that drug. Andy, do you have any advice for somebody that is dealing with bipolar or a loved one who has bipolar and how they would seek treatment? Sure. I mean, the first thing about seeking treatment is to make sure that it's not the family that wants treatment. I mean, that's always a good start. But making sure the patient is going to be a willing patient is critical. Patients that are dragged to mental health care professionals generally are not successful. But if you are going to be seeing a doctor, make sure the doctor that you're seeing is one that's been referred to you highly. Make sure that your general practitioner is not prescribing your psychiatric drugs. GPs don't know the first thing about psychiatric drugs, although they would argue that. But they've not done more than a six-week rotation in psychiatry. So it's very odd for them to know too much more than the average person about depression or bipolar disorder. Although most people I know, probably like 40% of the people I know say, my GP prescribes my psychiatric drugs. I don't see a psychiatrist. Makes no sense to me. The second thing is there are good psychiatrists and there are bad psychiatrists. 
Like there are good doctors and bad doctors. And sometimes it's really helpful that your psychiatrist is not just the person who prescribes meds, but it's also somebody who can talk to you about your bipolar disorder. You bring up a good point. If you can't force a loved one into seeking treatment unless they're willing to get treatment, do you have any advice for those loved ones to kind of nudge them along? Would you like, I mean, I would recommend them read your book or, or. Well, I mean, I always, you know, been in literally hundreds of situations where people have asked me that question. My son, my daughter, not as often, you know, my mom or my dad has an illness that resembles bipolar disorder, but he or she doesn't recognize it as in total denial, is destructive, his life is falling apart, but he doesn't want to see a doctor. And I'd say half the times that patient ends up in real trouble. That patient ends up in prison. That patient ends up in an emergency room. It's very rare to find a patient who's a motivated patient. And that patient has to be motivated by somebody who's been successful, who's been to hell and back. And, you know, often that's why my story does work, because I couldn't have been in a worse place. I mean, there was nothing good about my life at age 28. I was waiting to be indicted by the feds in New York for counterfeiting artwork, wire fraud, five counts. I was facing 25 years in prison, I would have gotten out of, I still would have been in prison today had I been convicted on every count and sent to jail for the maximum of five. I either had $800,000 in my freezer or I had a dollar and I was begging for food or stealing food from grocery stores. I was squatting at apartments. I was desperately trying to get disability. All of my friends had given up on me. My family was always there, but they just couldn't understand why I couldn't pull it together. But, you know, I used to tell them, my psychiatrist can't pull it together. We're not getting me better. I'm trying. Like, I'm willing to do this ECT thing. I'm willing to do anything. Just give me something. I'll try it. Yeah, and also I think that along with a lot of the hypersexuality is also common with mania, so is self-medicating, right? So sure. whatever else you were doing in addition, like probably fueled it, right, with the cocaine. Cocaine and, cocaine and alcohol and Ritalin and anything. Right. Anything to keep moving and to keep moving faster because to keep moving faster meant that I was avoiding a potential fall. Right. I didn't want to fall. Right. Because my depressions and like nobody else had ever explained to me, I mean like in a book, I've always read about depression as being like really dark and people would like just, I read that people lie in bed and they do nothing. But the depression side of my manic depression for me was just like alive and rageful and just screaming and I, I would have prayed to be depressed and to be in a bed. And just so you know, if I had a choice between mania and depression, I probably would have chosen depression. And a lot of people who have depression say the other thing, God, I just wish I had mania. That would be great. And I always say, yeah, mania is really a lot of fun because every day your life is at risk and you think you're going to die. And I did feel like I was going to die every single day. That's really interesting, though, that you bring up that point about depression not being just how we see it. Like the layperson, I do think of it as somebody that just doesn't want to get out of a dark room. And you're saying that it became rage for you. Yeah. Anger, and yelling, anger screaming, and, and then feeling very sad and like, oh, my God, look how far I went with that. I mean, I didn't feel that way ever about my mania. I didn't ever say to myself, oh, my God. When I was manic, I became, you know, so out of control. But when that rage came and that depression and that anger came, I felt so guilty about it. I never felt guilty about the mania, no matter what it was that I did, whether it was hurting people, whether it was breaking the law. It wasn't about hurting people. The mania knew no bounds, you know, choose anything and I would do it to the extreme. It didn't matter what it was. And there's still a lot of residual mania, you know, I have to check it every day. 
And how do you check it? Like just on your own? I mean, I realized last night at 3 a.m. that time was up. Meaning like time that you force yourself to sleep. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing about my bipolar disorder today is I know that my time on this earth is limited. And like, how much time can I spend on the internet checking the life expectancy calculator? <laughs> you know, until like, I mean, okay, it's like, fuck, I've done it now like 12 <laughs> times and I can't get past 94. Okay, I'm going to cheat on some of these questions. Or I'm going to revamp. There's, it's like they're all done by insurance companies, but they're like 15 questions. And it's like, do you want to live past 94 anyway? I want to. Oh, yeah. Do you? I want to live. In, I want to live. You want to be immortal? I just, I mean, I, would, I could live until 140. I'd be so happy. I just. I have so, you have to understand, I've lost so much of this life. I mean, I probably could have been diagnosed so early, like at 12. And I wasn't diagnosed until 28. And then from 28 to 40, I suffered. Then I met my ex-wife at 40, and I had five great years until we were divorced. There's so many lost years. What's so strange is it's an interesting anecdote. It's like, it was just my 35th college reunion, and everyone's like, oh my God, Andy, you've got to come, you've got to come, you know, you were the life of the party. Yeah, I was the life of the party because I was so ill, but you didn't know. <laughs> then I was thinking, wait, I can't go because I've only been well for so few years. Like, I feel like I'm 30 years old and you guys are all 57 and you've accomplished so much and I've accomplished nothing. You know, you guys are all retired and I've written this stupid book, which isn't a stupid book. We know it's not a stupid book, but there's another book coming, of course. But, you know, you guys are retired. You did all the right things. You went to business school, your doctors, your lawyers, your playwrights, your artists, you know, you've all been so successful. I can't come back because I'm not ready yet. I'll come back. At 40 or 3 a.m. But Andy, I think what you're discussing is what so many people feel, which is that quote unquote midlife crisis. Oh, feeling. absolutely. There's... I mean, everyone, when they hit the midlife field, they're questioning Am I doing enough? Have I done enough? Did I do enough? No, 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 no. But we all that's such feel a good that point. Way. That's such a good point. But that's why I want to live, you know, I mean, longer. And trust me, I got a couple of clues on the life expectancy thing. Always wear your seatbelt, you get one extra year. Oh, yeah, mm, that's... I do. I always wear my seatbelt. Yeah, you do. Okay, so good. So you're working on a sequel to Electro Boy. Yeah, it's temporarily called Electro Dad. Electro Dad. I yeah, it's a bad it. working title. No, it works. Yeah, it's okay. I like it. But it's about finally getting well, meeting this woman. It's about marriage. It's about divorce, which is a painful topic. And it's almost like an illness that destroys the family like bipolar disorder, and everything that ensues, which in my case was worse than a normal divorce. Divorce is not easy. And then I know that you have adaptation of Electro Boy currently in production. It's not in production. It's oh. been in development for five years. Oh, in development. Years. In development. I mean, okay. HBO originally bought it. It's okay. been optioned every year since 1999. Okay. So, I mean, I just feel like it needs to be made. It may be made. Yeah. It may be made. Yeah. Andy, yeah. if you could write your 20-year-old self a love letter, what would it say? My 20-year-old self when I was in college, I don't know what a love letter is, but what do you mean by love letter? I mean, advice you would give to your younger self that is filled with hope and compassion that would help guide you through the years, what would you tell yourself? Well, it's not a word I usually use, but I would start with, dude, you're headed in the wrong direction because I didn't know yet. Take a deep breath, look around and see what's going on around you. This is not normal behavior. But I was getting help. That's the interesting thing. I was seeing a therapist, you know, at college when I was 18. I just don't think she knew what I was talking about. Well, but you weren't diagnosed as bipolar, so... I don't think she knew what she was talking about at all. I think she was just listening to me. I mean, I was giving her every indication that I was bipolar. I'm like, well, this week I fucked 11 people on my hall. I did 11 grams of Coke. I drank 11 beers last night. I haven't gone to class in 11 days. I'm failing every subject. And then, like Superman, I'd go speak to every teacher and say, you know, I've been having some problems 
with my mom and dad. I need to make things up. I'm going to take that test again, if you'll allow me. I'm going to rewrite the paper. So I was the guy who never went to class. And then when it came time for graduation, my parents showed up and, you know, there were 600 of us who graduated, but I graduated with high honors, but only someone who's bipolar could do that if they had screwed up as much as I had. So psychologists and psychiatrists out there, make sure you look for those warning signs. <laughs> they, were ba- they were basic symptoms. It's not like I was withholding right, information. Right. It would be like going to a doctor and the doctor says, where does it hurt? Right. And you'd say, I don't know. Well, the doctor wouldn't take it for that long. And I have to believe that you would have told your younger self to have compassion that what you were actually experiencing was a mental illness. But I wasn't being hard on myself yet. My behavior was just out of control. I'm not allowed to ask the questions here, but... Oh, you of course are. But the question I'd like to ask would be, like, what would you write to yourself today? Okay. That question is even more important because... I would love to hear that. Yeah, that is like, you know, dear Andy, this illness is an illness that will never be cured, but you're doing a really good job. You're coping and managing really well. Keep remembering to take your meds. You take them three times a day. When your doctor says to get your blood levels done, don't ignore it. Try to stick to a normal schedule. I know it's tough. Try not to take on too many projects. You are dealing with too much right now in your life, and it's enough for five people. That kind of thing. I love that. Well, that's a love letter to yourself now. That's great. So do you have any happiness habits, any things that you do that kind of ground you or bring you happiness? My kids keep me grounded and taking care of my kids keeps me grounded. Being very involved in their lives and in their schools keeps me grounded. And their knowing that I know what's going on in their lives at school makes me feel good. And being the same kind of parent that my parents were to me. And they were good parents. They just didn't see the mental illness coming on. I mean, that makes me feel great. And your other question, happiness habits? Like, happiness is not one of my favorite words. I'm generally a happy person. I'm not running around miserable, but it's very easy for me to be happy. You know, I don't have to go on a vacation to be happy. I've been everywhere, like everywhere. I don't really need to go anywhere to be happy. That's amazing. So you're able to just be happy wherever you are. I'm happy that I'm not dead. Well, there you go. That's 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 gratitude. I'm happy that I'm alive. Yeah. Being happy to be alive is like an incredible I mean, I'm happy to be... I'm 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 most happy sitting here and I'm most happy sharing information with you, which may be helpful to somebody else. For sure. And I kind of feel like This is going to sound totally crazy, but most things that I do often do sound crazy. You know, I don't mind being poked and prodded, and I love answering questions if it's going to be helpful. I love talking to college audiences because if I will speak to an audience of like 600 people, this happened at UCSB. I spoke to about 600 people, and the dean called me two days later and said, oh, great, six kids took a leave of absence. They went to (laughs) mental health services, and... They just don't feel they're well. That's a good I've had some kind of impact. And I knew that they didn't want to come to this event, so I said, let's do the Q&A first, which is kind of fun. You can't do a QA and a first, but we did it. (laughs) We did it first. But I like talking to audiences. Yeah, and I mean, those six kids, you potentially could have prevented them from going down I mean, I know when I save lives. I mean, I I, I get phone calls all the time. I got a phone call last week from somebody who said, I've just taken 90 trazodone, which is it's a strong medication. 90 trazodone is not going to sit well with you. And I said, where are you? And she told me she was in Birmingham. And I said, have you taken anything else? And she said, I'm just drinking alcohol. I said, you know what? Give me your number and I will call you right back. And I called 911 in Birmingham because you can't just call 911 anywhere. And I called her back on the phone. And then I heard 
the ambulance coming. But that happens more than three times a month. That happens a lot. It happens a lot. Well, that's and it's a always, testament and it's to always, you. No, well, not really. It's always somebody yeah. who's read my book, and I think, oh, wow, my book has been so inspiring that you overdosed. <laughs> well, <laughs> what I mean, awesome. You've now read my success story, and you're calling me after an overdose. Thank you so much. See, I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it as that they've come to the point where they think, right. I want to live. No, I was going to say the exact same to... thing. It's the final cry. It's like, right. I'm going to reach out to the guy who yes. shared his story with me. I'm going to share my story with him, and he's going to help me. That's amazing. Not too long ago, I got an email from somebody who tracked me down saying, here's my number, call me. It's an emergency. I called the number, and I said, hi, it's Andy. What's going on? He said, I just finished reading your book. I was at a rehab for three weeks, and I've just left the rehab. I said, it's one in the morning. He said, you have to come get me. It was Memorial Day weekend. I said, where are you? He said, I'm on the PCH, Pacific Coast Highway. I said, I can't just come pick you up. Where's your family? And he said, they're in Palm Desert. I said, give me your mom's phone number. I called her, and she said, we're not driving up to L.A. We're in Palm Desert. It's too far. He's in a rehab. I said, no, he's left the rehab, and they won't let him back in. And we're done with him. I said, well, do I have your permission to go pick him up? They said, fine, go pick him up, and good luck with him. So I called him back, and I said, where are you exactly? He told me exactly where he was. I said, what are you wearing? He said, I'm just wearing a T-shirt. I said, nothing else? He said, nothing else. So I found him. I brought some clothes with me. I picked him up. I said, what were you doing in this rehab? He said, my parents put me there. It was a, like an eight-week bipolar treatment program. I brought him back to my house. My kids were not with me. I said, I can't even get you to a doctor. And he refused to go to an emergency room, which was just incredible. And I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe there's a lot that I can do here. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a trained professional. But basically, this kid's been suffering for probably 10 years. So what can I do with him over three days? So the initial problem was that he thought all the food I had in the house was poisoned, so he wouldn't eat in the house. So he had to choose every Japanese restaurant that was ridiculously expensive. But we basically talked for probably 20 hours. And he said, rehab just doesn't work for me. I said, have you ever found a doctor that you've been able to speak to? He said, never. I said, would you please come meet my doctor with me on Tuesday? He said, absolutely. So we basically hung out. What we talked about his illness, and we talked about how he had suffered, and we talked about how his family was not supportive. And we also talked about how nobody understood him. So I brought him to my doctor, and he spent about three hours with him that Tuesday, and he's just fantastic. And then he finally agreed to be admitted to the hospital. It was the first time in his life. He spent two weeks in the hospital and then agreed to go back to a rehab that we all picked together. His family, for the first time, was supportive because they read my story, and they're like, well, he got better. James seems to have taken to him taken to this doctor, and really seems to want to get well for the first time. But it was an odd operation, you know, just going to pick up some kid half-dressed on the side of Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. The fact that you did that is a testament to your character. I have to say, personally, I probably wouldn't as, you know, a woman. But... I probably shouldn't. Right. But... I probably shouldn't have done it, but it's the way, like tonight, I probably shouldn't do what I know what I'm going to do, which is to help this woman who's found me through an interview she saw on YouTube on a Canadian talk show who said, you know, my sister's outside of Toronto, I'm in Algeria, and her bipolar disorder is destroying the whole family. Can you make her better? She's living with my mom. She's destroying my life. We've moved back to Algeria because she's destroying our lives. 
she's got three kids who live with her former ex-husband who's bipolar. I'm like, whoa, you know, like this is a lot to ask, you know, one guy. Maybe that's your calling is to relate to other people that are suffering. It is my calling. I mean, originally when I wrote this book, it was my calling to tell a story about Manhattan in the 80s and 90s. It was not to even, you know, broach the subject of mental health to the extent that I did in the book. And it was never to run around the country and lecture about mental illness and suicide prevention and wellness and wanting to get well, because I can't tell you that the only way people ever get well when they're mentally ill is if they want to be well. I mean, if you don't want to be well, it's kind of fun to stay unwell when you have bipolar disorder. It's a nice run. I did it for many, 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 many years. Until it's not anymore. Well, it's not until you're standing in federal court in front of a judge and a jury comes out with a verdict, and the verdict isn't great. So I just wanted to share that with you. No, that's awesome. I'm happy for you that you found, in so many words, a passion that you can help others. I mean, I can speak for myself. That's how I feel with this project. Better to do it by speaking to 600 students or writing a book for a couple hundred thousand people than saving one person at a time. Although there's a calling to save one person at a time. If somebody calls you, what am I going to do? Say no? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I wish I could have just called somebody, but I didn't know anybody. You don't know, like that one kid that you saved could pay it forward. And that's the beauty in helping one person too. Great story. Thank you for sharing. So where can people find you? I'm on Twitter at ElectroBoyUSA. And uh, And I'll have your book link on my show notes. Well, I really appreciate this interview. It's been so enlightening. Is there anything else that you want to add? No, you touched upon a good point. I think that one of the biggest issues is that People don't seek treatment when they have bipolar disorder because they're feeling great. They're feeling on top of the world. And the expectation of their family and friends is that they need to be in treatment. But it's really hard to convince somebody who's really not feeling bad to be in treatment. So that's why something has to, you know, fall apart. Right. And it's okay. I mean, it happened for me. It happens for most people I know. Were they like quote-unquote, hit rock bottom and just can't handle living another day that way. Yeah, or somebody tells them, you can't do this anymore. Right. And, you know, speaking of my own experience, that's when my mom finally sought treatment when I threatened to take her granddaughters away from her. So, right. but I really, really appreciate this interview and your honesty. And I know you're going to help a lot of people and inspire a lot of people. So thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Rachel. This has been awesome. Thanks. I want to thank Benjamin King for that awesome intro you heard at the beginning and for helping me produce this podcast. And thank you to Ari Silberman, the music composer. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.